again for tuning into the Clan Hatton Association YouTube channel. And back by popular demand, we have with us Philip Beddoes, Clan Shenehi of Clan McBain. And I'm still hoping that I'm not butchering that um, title. <laughs> it's spot on. And I wanted to point out, you can't really see it on here, but it's a bright blue. It looks kind of darker. I fixed my Clan McBain crest. I put the blue. The color of the wreath. I Excellent. Did. Well done, Cindy. I did. And I'm wearing my little cat that Richard and Lisa gave to me, Richard McBain of McBain. Oh, yeah. They, um, Excellent. Yes. I, I don't that know. was from the um, 2009 re signing of the Band of Union, wasn't it? I'm not sure if I'm supposed to let people know that that was given to me or not. Yeah, <laughs> I it. do. Thank you, Richard and Lisa. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, welcome. I We wanted to delve a little bit more into some of the Clan McBain history about Gillies McBain, um, who was involved in the Battle of Culloden. Should we start with Gillies? Is that is that a good start point? Although we might go back in time, but let's let's start there. How about that? It's wherever you feel is appropriate to begin the storyline, because again, you know, you're talking to a person who doesn't have all the information. There might be something very important. If you feel like you need to go back in time and start somewhere else, please do. Um, because I know it's going to be fascinating and intriguing just to listen to you. So begin wherever you feel is most appropriate. So I think um, some some words come to mind that, that somebody wrote describing Clan McBain as ever a warlike clan. And I think this reputation for being a great warriors um, is, it seems to have gone down the ages. Um, maybe Maybe that's one of the explanations for the the chief having as one of the quarters, the four quarters of his shield, he has um, one of them is a sword, a, 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 a big claymore. So perhaps that 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 that's an allusion to the sort of fighting prowess of, of the McBains. I mean it, that that is first recorded in the 1600s, so it was already old by that time, I would guess. Um, by reputation. But Gillies, so um, uh, Culloden, oh my goodness, there's so much to say about Culloden. Um, and uh, many people may have read a book by a guy called John Preble called Just Culloden. Um, uh, un unfortunately, John Preble left no source um, footnotes. He, he wrote a, a wonderful um energizing story and um about blood and the run-up to it the aftermath and it's a great book um and he and it's you know it it goes at quite a pace and the detail of the battle of blood that he provides is 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 incredibly um deep but there is a problem in that uh, he didn't provide his sources um so no one knows where he got all the little bit little anecdotes from um but having unpacked quite a lot of it it's very clear that john preble put lots of different anecdotes of different people together and um applied them either to the wrong person or or, or merged two people with the same name and made both stories about them um about a single person or but it, it it's not sadly um a, a very reliable source um, for what went on, um, unless um, somewhere in in in, a, in the depths of a library are John Preble's handwritten notes that tell us where he got each of these stories and how they ended up in the order they were in his book. But it's it it's it's a great book and it's full of full of of passion and I guess the the the, the horror of of the battle and the horror of the aftermath for people and the sadness of it all. So he. He conveys all of that very well, but it's not a, a textbook to follow um, for the history. But as we know, um, the, 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 the captain of Clan Hatton at the time was um, Aeneas McIntosh of McIntosh. And he had actually, he was in charge of a company of the Black Watch. And so he'd given his oath to the, um, the king and as had 
um, the chiefs of some other clans and leading members of Clan Hatton and, and other clans. And so it was a little bit difficult for him to suddenly then come out for the prince. So it was his wife, very young wife, Lady Anne, um, who was a Farquharson, and she raised the clan. And um, I think just the sight of her uh, riding through the villages um, and settlements and ar around the hills um, was enough to bring a, a, a pretty big regiment together. Some people have said actually what Angus did is, um, or Aeneas and Angus, the same thing, Macintosh, is that they were very canny. And in effect, by splitting allegiance, they made it more likely that um, that the Macintoshes and Clan Hatton more widely could recover and not be seen as um, completely in the wrong, whichever side won. So they were hedging their bets a little bit. And Aeneas was actually given into the custody of his own wife, which was rather sweet. <laughs> so uh, that, that was quite, quite fun. Um, but he'd given his word, so he's obviously a man of honour. Uh, on, so the the person that was chosen to be the colonel of the regiment was Alexander McGillivray, whose father, Farquhar, had died in 1714. Alexander was a young man, and he was very tall, uh, very good looking, um, red hair he was remembered for. And, um, and, and he was a chap that Lady Anne put in charge of the regiment. And he recruited other officers and one of them was Gillis McBain who was then chief of his clan his father having died some years before and Gillis was then living at Dermagarry which was um, first just then um, from Tamartin and north from Moy sorry south of Moy and um, and Gillis became one of the one of the majors the senior major of the regiment and it, it was recounted that actually he was a very tall man and some of the oldest records have said he was six foot four and a quarter inches and supposedly the tallest man in the, in the prince's army so alexander and his cousin um gillies and a whole lot of other relations and cousins um mcgillivrays and mackintoshes and others who formed the officer corps of the regiment um i can read you out actually if it's if it's of interest um, I've got actually a list. The, there was a one, wonderful series in the old journal of the Clan Hatton Association, running from 1980 to 1982, three um, parts uh, by Robert McGillivray, who was a historian of Clan McGillivray. And he wrote a, um, a record of the officers of the Macintosh Regiment. Um, and, and, and it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant record. And um, he's got there as the colonel, there was a lieutenant colonel, Lachlan McIntosh, who was a merchant at Inverness. Not very much is really recorded too much of his involvement in the battle. He apparently escaped. Um, the majors were John McGillivray and Gillies McBain. And the captains um, were Angus McIntosh of Far, Alexander McIntosh of Essex, Farquhar McGillivray, younger of Dalcrombie, Alexander McGillivray, Donald Fraser, and James Dallas of Cantry. The Dallases being one of those families who were weren't officially listed as one of the clans or families of Clan Hatton, but they seem to have been very much adopted and treated as such and married. Um, there were lots of marriages between Dallas's, McBain's, McIntosh's and others. Um, the lieutenants were John Shaw, younger of Kinrara, John Shaw, Robert McGillivray, Archibald McGillivray, his brother, um, Donald Dallas, Duncan McIntosh, Simon McIntosh, Angus McBain, who was taxman of Faley, um, James Shaw, and another Gillies McBain, who escaped, who was a tenant of Major Gillies McBain on his land at Banacton in the parish of Dawes. Um, the ens and there was the ensign. Now, there was also another Gillies who was said to have been there from Faley, and there was a fourth Gillies from Al Dowry um, on, on uh, Loch Ness. And his, he was the son of Donald uh, McBain of Al Dowry, younger branches of the um, Chiefly family. So there were, there were lots of them, but to have four Gillies McBains 
with the battle created some confusion. So one one was a major, uh, one was a lieutenant, um, two were soldiers. Um, so the major, um, because also he was the tallest man in the prince's army, was called Gillies Moor, which means big Gillies. And that also helps to differentiate him from the other three Gillies who were at the battle. When he's, ri when he's written in there. Do you know of that list that you just read off? Um, do you know who, perhaps if anyone, survived and was able oh, to... So, um, the Lieutenant Colonel Lachlan McIntosh escaped. Uh, Alexander McIntosh of Essex escaped, badly wounded. Uh, Farquhar McGillivray, younger of Dalcrombie, escaped. Donald Fraser escaped. James Shaw, younger of Conrara, escaped, but died of his wounds later. Um, Archibald McGillivray escaped. His brother, Robert, was killed and had an, an incredible story about him, which you should cover in the McGillivray section of these talks, I think, because that, that was a, a, an incredible story of how he took on um, some of the government soldiers. And uh, David, Donald D Dallas escaped badly wounded. Um, Simon McIntosh probably killed, but no one really knows. And same with James Shaw. Gillies McBain, the younger one who was the tenant of the of the major, he escaped and actually acted as a creditor and, um, uh, and cautioner for the testament dative of Major Gillies after the battle. Um, and became the next taxman of Banacton in succession. Um, so those are the only only officers. Um, so that was that's three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve officers killed. That's wow. a lot. I think a lot of times most of us believe or 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 think that absolutely everyone was slaughtered in that battle, and I know it was a slaughter, but. There were some people who did, in fact, escape. So that's good to know. The where the 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 key thing for for Glen Hatton is that the the and the brunt of the battle as as there's a guy called John Hossack who'd been an ex provost of Inverness, and he wrote an account. He said the brunt of the battle fell on Glen Hatton. So a very a very terse observation as Robert McGillivray um, recorded, but it it and the reason for this is that they were actually in the middle. So they were actually one of three regiments of Clan Hatton, uh, which is quite something in itself. So there was one that was raised by Lady Anne McIntosh. So that's called Lady Anne McIntosh's regiment. Then on the left, in the center of the field, were the Farquharsons. Information, read about a lot of information about how the battle went down. Was Clan Hatton, were the Macintoshes the first to charge? Um, was there an issue about the charge with some going before others and reasons why they did that? Um, you know, there's yes. all rumors. And so that that's what I wanted to hear from you because you never know, okay, is this true? You know, somebody was upset about being placed on the wrong side I don't know <laughs> of the battle. And so they, they refused to charge in the initial charge. Can you, is that what you wanted to kind of share with us? And yeah, so uh, that, that, that's actually a very good point actually, Cindy, because it, 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 it's, it's the run up to the charge and the charge itself that resulted in the, in, in what followed. Um, so the, that there'd been an attempt at a night march to make an attack on Cumberland's, um, camp and near Nan at night, and and, it, and the weather was terrible, and the men just wandered all over the place, and they never made contact with Cumberland's camp. I mean, it was a it was a it was a brilliant idea to make a a, a night attack, but they just didn't manage to make contact. So they came back exhausted and hungry, and the weather was terrible, and when they were standing, having taken, um, you know. Their battle formations at, uh, on Culloden Moor. Um, they had sleet in their faces, um, so they were they hadn't fed. They they'd been, you know, marching around all night, and um, so they were pretty down. You can imagine, um, keeping their spirits up for sure. But it 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 was not a 
not a good place to start um, the battle in that, that condition. And the, the government army had much better artillery. So they were able to pound the Jacobites um, with their artillery and a lot of a lot of men were killed while just standing in their ranks. And you can imagine if you get soldiers standing in their ranks, not able to charge, and when the Highland charge was such a, a powerful and effective way um, for them to, to win battles as they'd found in the past, um, they were getting frustrated, waiting for the order to attack. And the um, I think the, the order was sent by somebody who was then um, shot um, on his way to give the order. So the order was delayed. And Tanhattan were the first to lose all patience with waiting around while the cannons were bombarding them. And so they charged. They were the first to charge. Now, what happened was that um, they, as they charged, they had sleep coming in their faces. Um, they um, they went towards a road which was going across the moor, and I think the road probably gave the, the the ground there around the road gave a little bit of cover. And actually, where the can is, the memorial can, which was actually built by a relation of the McBain and the Shaw chiefs. Um, Duncan Duncan Forbes, a uh, later Duncan Forbes of Culloden, um, he built this to his Jacobite um, Jacobite dead and remembering his his cousin's killed there. Um, they went into a bit of ground that that gave them slight cover, um, but they also were facing uh, the um, grape shot from the cannons. So there was a lot of confusion, and there was a sort of instinctive reaction to follow the ground, avoid the grape shot. <laughs> And so they veered right and they bumped into um, the Camerons and you know, Appin men, others in the middle, in that chaos. They checked themselves. I think I've got this right. Any, anyone can look this up and find another count. They checked themselves and restarted the charge. But having started in the middle of the um, line of battle, they ended up at the far right colliding with a whole lot of other regiments into Barrel's regiment on the government side. Oh. So Barrel's, unfortunately, um, you know, had three or more regiments landing on them, literally landing on them with a with a great rush. And so they were pretty decimated. And um and the first one was their their colonel, Colonel Rich, he was killed. And um and then Gillies McBain, um, the major Gillies um, Moore, he he was he then um, killed um, uh, Robert Kerr, who was captain of the Grenadiers in Barrel's regiment, and his father was the Marquis of Lothian, so he was a very a, you know Lord Robert Kerr, so he was a very he was the most um, high profile person killed at the battle on the government side, and then they went through Barrel's first line. They went through to the second line. Uh, Alexander McGillivray, the colonel of the regiment, was killed, um, or he was wounded, made his way back some way to the Well of the Dead, um, which is you know one you can find on the battlefield, and died there. Um, that was the way he died. So when they charged, they actually, um, if you go to the battlefield today, the, the area the National Trust have is not the entire battlefield. So when you find where Clanhattan were, they're virtually that that they're at the end before you hit the road. So it's almost as if they're on the far left of the line, whereas actually that's the middle. As they charged towards barrels, they actually went straight past the um uh the, the today's monument to the Jacobite dead. And so you can see the ground there and the way in which it, it dips slightly why therefore they would have actually followed that line for cover a little bit as well. And so G Gillies um, survived. He was supposed to have been wounded in that initial uh, um, charge. And then they started retreating because the government army put some regiments on the flanks. So they had men in front of them firing at them, men both sides of them firing at them. And they were outflanked. So there was a bit of, you know, a lot of 
Van Hatten would have died at that moment. They retreated, and it was there are several stories about Gillies, which potentially might have been stories of two Gillies, McBain's, potentially or mix up. Um, we we don't really know, and there's a there's been debate about it in an in a in an old um, Victorian edition of Notes Scottish Notes and Queries, which debates have two Gillies stories being mixed up. We don't know, but what we what what we do know is that Gillies did retreat, um, and it, it is recorded that he told um, the men around him to look after themselves, and he would stay and fight and hold a rearguard action against those that, that were pursuing them. And one story says that the Cameron Argyle, sorry, Campbell Argyle militia were trying to break down one of the enclosure walls and take the Highlanders in the flank, and that Gillies stood in the gap in the wall and mowed them down like Dockins, as Ian Breck Mac MacDonald um, is said to have uh, said. I love that phrase, he mowed them down like Dockins. <laughs> uh, but but um What's it but dock actually the <laughs> dock leaves, yeah, like dock leaves. Yeah. Which uh, do you have dock leaves in North North America? I d I'm not entirely sure what they are. So it's ah, so dock leaves <laughs> um are often found where you find nettles. And if you've been stung by a nettle, you get the dock leaf and you rub it on your skin oh. and it relieves the 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 the, the, the nettle sting. We don't have a lot of nettles on the west coast of the United States. I have come across <laughs> of a little in the in the wild, but for the most part, we don't. We have a thing called poison oak. <laughs> right. So, um, I, I I can I can read a, a little bit of an account that would, about Gillies here. That would that would be fantastic. I'd love to hear that. So it says that he was, you know, foremost in the charge with his cousin Colonel McGillivray of Dunmaglass. And um, yes, yeah, so it said, I'm taking this from the far manuscript. It's a lovely little count. When the remaining part of the regiment retreated, he said to those near him to take care of themselves and he would endeavor to save himself against the attack of their pursuers. Being an excellent swordsman, he got his back to an old wall. So not in a gap, but his back to the old wall. And that's also the story of the family. Still pointed out, which was nearby in the center of the field of action. Here he was attacked by Lord Kingston's horse, they were dragoons, and so bravely did he defend himself that it is said he killed 13 of the dragoons. The officer who commanded called out to his men that nothing but lead would kill that big rebel. A volley was discharged and he received a wound which broke his leg and another mortal one under the right ear of which he died on the field. So apparently there were also other accounts say an officer came along and said, stop, save that man, so incredibly brave, don't kill him. They felt it was on, dishonorable to kill him after his efforts. Um, so if he, if he killed 13 dragoons in that, with his claymore in that moment, and he'd killed Lord Robert Kerr in the charge, that's 14, he must have killed some others in the charge as well. So he's, some, his, his, his tally is well over 14, I would say. Um, and, and then the field of battle was strictly watched by parties of the King's army for several weeks to prevent other Highlanders searching. And apparently some friends marked the, the place that his body was and uh, removed it after the battle. And, and, and it was buried in Daviot Churchyard, apparently, at a place that when the far manuscript was written in the 1700s, where the grave is still pointed out. Sadly, we don't know where that grave is. Um, now, there's another fascinating story, is that um, um, that that Cumberland either saw some of this action with him taking on the dragoons um, single-handed, or he then heard about it. Anyway, he came up and had um, this is a story from the family that. Um, that he that he had Gilly's body lent up against the wall, uh, uh, his bonnet put back on his head, and that um, it, it thought that he actually he measured, had the body measured, so that um, hence we get the height six foot four and a quarter inches. It seems superfluous to mention the quarter um, in some of the old accounts unless it was precisely measured. Um, 
so that 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 would seem to ring true but the other the other person that was there from the family was gilly's own son donald who was very young at the time so he apparently he was captured and cumberland apparently being so impressed by gilly's bravery he um he gave a commission in the army to gilly's son donald um who then joined the army along with um the following year along with a whole lot of other cousins and 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 people of clanhattan lots of clanhattan joined drum landrig's regiment and then later fraser's highlanders and they all went off to canada um and donald donald fought at the battle of quebec where he was wounded um so it was a big that Culloden was was that sort of major moment lots of mcbain's lots of um clanhattan but um gillies was immortalized one in james logan's book um about the the highlanders um just trying to um grab grab that if i can if i've got it oh, the clans of the scottish highlands 1845 james logan and that the, ian um, mckeon an artist called mckeon did all the um illustrations and he did some wonderful pictures which are very famous of, of it's either some famous figure from each clan or an imaginary figure of each clan but for clan mcbain he did a picture of gillies with his back to the wall um it's magnificent and 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 um and being shot by a dragoon um but it's a it's a it's an incredible painting and um some people say oh he looks pretty smart he's got a very smart ornate waistcoat well in actual fact paintings of the time show officers and and senior people um dressed that way at the time so you know it wasn't that he was putting on his sunday best he was a senior major in a regiment he had to look smart as a senior officer um just as the officers on the other side um and it's there also they record that he was six foot four inches and a quarter um uh but he also records this um famous um poem some people have said that was a poem written by lord byron um that starts um the clouds may pour down on culloden's red plain but their waters shall flow or it's crimson in vain for their drops shall seem few to the tears for the slain but mine are for thee my brave gillies mcbain and it's an incredible um uh poem um but actually it wasn't written by lord byron oh. um what what actually happened is that it was written um and this we discover this from the farm manuscript it was written in gallic and it was an elegy written by someone called his that is just called his um uh his his nurse i think it is hang on uh yes composed by his nurse after his death oh, who my... his nurse would be i don't know um that sounds rather intriguing um but is it um to share is it possible to share that um maybe if you send it to me i can post it since it yeah. is our spotlight and the farm manuscript has a has a has a unique edition of it oh. with some words that are different from others only very very slightly but he tells us that it was written written in gallic uh, also far tells us about um cumberland having his body raised up and supported so that he could see it against the wall um so that's there as well and um but actually this gallic was then translated by somebody and i think this is where we hear it um by an academic at aberdeen university that's another story that um so i think that's probably what happened oh and then what happened is it it was rewritten um this translation by or reworked by lord Byron in order for it to be set to music by Dr. Clark Whitfield, who is described later Cambridge now of Hereford, 1817. And it, it, it's amazing. Uh, and and, and, it, and it, um, it, it ends with the last two verses are really lovely. I mean, it tells the, the story. I don't know what whether we've got time, whether, yes, whether, whether, whether I should read the whole thing. Wait, please I mean, I mean, do, please yeah? do. Yes. Okay, so it, 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 it's really quite, quite a poem. So, the clouds may pour down on, it's called Gillies McBain. 
The clouds may pull down on Culloden's dark plain, but the waters shall wash o'er its crimson in vain, for their drops shall seem few to the tears for the slain, but mine is for thee, my brave Gillies McBain. Though thy cause was the cause of the injured and brave, though thy death was the heroes and glorious thy grave, with thy dead foes around thee piled high on the plain, my sad high heart bleeds, Earl thee, my Gillies McBain. How the horse and the horseman thy single hands slew, but what could the mightiest single arm do? A hundred like thee might the battle regain, but cold are thy hand and heart, Gillies McBain. With thy back to the wall and thy breast to the targe, targe being a, a, the little shield, full flash thy claymore in the face of their charge, and the blood of their boldest that barren heath stain. But alas, thine is reddest, third Gillies McBain. Hewn down, but still fighting, thou sunkest to the ground. Thy plague was one gore, and thy breast was one wound. Thirteen of thy foes by thy right hand lay slain. O oh, would there were thousands for Gillies McBain. O oh, loud and long heard shall thy coronet be, and high o'er the heather thy, thy cane we shall see. And deep in each bosom thy name shall remain, but deepest in mine, my brave Gillies McBain. And daily the eyes of thy brave boy, that's his son, Donald, before shall thy plaid be unfolded, unsheath thy claymore, and the white rose shall bloom on his bonnet again, should he prove the true son of my Gillies McBain. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful and so sad, <laughs> but uh, you know, yeah. beautifully written. So I haven't heard the music. What I what I'm, what we must do is get the music recorded. Yes, we we must. If you can find it anywhere, please let me know. Yeah, you know, yeah. is it a, is it a? Yeah, I, I've never heard of it before. That's wonderful. I hope that all of the clan hatton association members and especially those who are interested or affiliated with clan mcbain can can um uh, will really appreciate um hearing you recite that poem that's beautiful yeah. beautifully done so one of the other one of the other gillies cindy was gillies of free and free was a farm on the tomartin estate um or certainly became part of the tomartin estate which was an estate um, held by another branch of McBain, the, Tamar the McBains of Tamartin, who were a branch of the McBains of Faley. And it just so happens that some years before Culloden, the, the head of the McBains of Tamartin died, leaving a young boy. So that boy played no part in the battle. So the estate wasn't lost. Faley, the, 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 the head of the McBains of Faley, was a captain in the Royal Ecosse, the French Royal Scots Regiment in the service of France. Cap wow. And he was a ca another Captain Donald McBain. Um, he went into exile with um, Camerons and a whole lot of others to um, Dunkirk and Burke um, over on the continent, um, quite, quite well known. But the Gillies of Free, there was another story recounted by James Logan which um, is, is really interesting, is that um, um, Cameron of Lochiel um, was wounded at Culloden in both ankles, and he was carried off the field by two of his relatives. And um, what, what then happened is that um, this Gillies McBain of Free, formerly of Faley, it's recorded, undertook to help convey Lochiel with his men to a hiding place from where he could then make his way to Loch Arbor back home in safety. They crossed the river Nairn at Craigie near Daviot. So that's very close to Faley, very, very close to Faley. And they met with some of Cumberland's soldiers crossing the river. So they had to fight. Um, they killed some of the soldiers um, and the others then, then ran off. And apparently Gilly's wife paid good attention to the wounded fugitives and with a, with, a, with a pair of scissors extracted two bullets from the leg of her husband who lived long afterwards 
and is commemorated by an altar table monument in the churchyard of Moy. Now, the table monument isn't there anymore, but there is a slab in that graveyard, grown over with grass, um, that had an inscription in Gaelic, apparently. So we're going to we 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 we're going to we're going to try and look it out, but it's definitely there because we've got a record of precisely where it was in the churchyard, and um, a, 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 another rather rather lovely, love lovely conversation. And and apparently there was another McBain um, that was also escaping from Culloden and um, reached reached a um, a stream, and he kept apparently jumping back and forth across the stream. And Cumberland soldiers got so fed up with jumping back and forth over the stream, um, they they gave up uh, <laughs> and left him to escape. <laughs> Do you ever find yourself in this position, just hop back and forth across the stream? You might escape. <laughs> I, yeah. I had heard something of that in, before, so it's 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 fun to know that that actually did happen. And well done. Well done, he <laughs> for being yeah. able to do that. Yeah. But I, I will link as much information um, about the Culloden battlefield and about uh, the McBains if as we can find to link. I will try to provide an aerial view. I've been to the battlefield many times myself, and um, I do know that there is a modern road running. Well, quite frankly, I think it's almost through the middle of it. Is it not? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Up. And so it's it's you know, if you go there, you you get the feeling that, oh, this is all that it is, or you, you know, what what you can see from the visitor center, that's only half of it. Um and yep. I, yeah, so and the McDonald's were on the other side as well as as other clans. Um they were. Yeah. And, and it, it's very well laid out. I mean, the National Trust do a wonderful job. There's a great visitor center. Um, we laid wreaths there with um, the commander of Clan McGillivray in McGillivray um, two years ago, two summers ago, uh, um, when we had our gathering. And that was very moving. We marched um, up, up to the Cairn, our, our bagpipers playing, and you can see Macintosh repeatedly on stones. And under those stones, in those areas, are, 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 are buried the bodies of those members of the clan who died on the on the battlefield um those that went taken taken off and buried elsewhere so it's very moving but it's well laid out you can see where barrel's regiment were you can see where clan hatton started you can therefore follow and walk to find your way from there to barrels through the cairn and and get some sense of the ground and what actually happened that day yes and they have flags up and they have markers along the, the path so you can follow along um it yeah. is it is interesting there there are two massive Macintosh mass graves um the one I can't remember if both of them but the one is so large that they placed a stone at either end um because it was so large and the Klein Hatton what was a confederation at that time suffered the most losses yes it did Yep, they suffered the most of any clan in the battle. It's it's very moving to be out there. I was very honored to be able to play pipes at the Karen for Clan Hatton Association at the at the 2009 um all of the events that we had to commemorate the um signing of the Band of Union yeah. that we did that year, but it was it was absolutely incredible and it was hard for me to play out there first of all it was very very windy but it was also very emotional and i was quite honored i thought goodness me you know to be this little bagpiper and be able to go out and play for to commemorate um that battle um it was very moving and so I'll, it's something i'll never forget and if you've ever been to the battlefield um and, and let us know if you want to make a comment in the down below if you've been there it's it's truly yeah. so We'll never forget, um, and yeah. and the time out there to to kind of wander around and get to know it and understand what they went through in that moment. Um, seems like a moment in time, but it changed 
it, it was maybe the last straw as we we spoke about on our last conversation i should say listening to you speak um yes it, the last it, it, straw it, it, clan way of life and it all ended it all ended then but the 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 remarkable thing really is if you look through all the records you just have to look at um how, how many um births and 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 marriages and whatever you, you you get the very um clear picture that actually um huge numbers of people um survived and lived on a lot of them won't have been involved in the battle because of where their homes were some of them were actually behind you know living behind the enemy um lines at the time the government lines and so it it it, it there was disaster and um, a lot of the states were, were bankrupted because of the mayhem that followed but actually um life did continue and people sort of regathered um actually two two summers ago cindy when we after we laid our wreaths on um to the two chieftains that, that died alexander mcgillivray and gillies mcbain we um ian mcgillivray who's the commander of clan mcgillivray his father, um, Duncan, came along. Um, those that may not know him, he 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 was a champion um, bagpiper in Scotland, and uh, he really is magnificent. He very kindly he went to a, um, an open area on the moor, not far from Barrel's regiment's um, position, and he played the Peabroch, the gathering of Clan Hatton. And that recording, we can we can add it under this video oh, um, yes. because we've got it on the Clan McBain site. Um, that sound on a windy day just sort of echoed across the moor and it was incredibly moving. Do you know, did they have pipers on the day of the battle? During oh, yes. Oh, yes. There would have been, every regiment would have had its pipers. Absolutely, for sure. Um, that would have been so important. And it was for communication. I don't know if a lot of people um, know, and I find myself when I'm performing explaining that the pipes are still a registered weapon of war still to this day. Um, and the reason for that is, is that they were an instrument of communication. So if you can think about before modern times and before technology, this was a very loud instrument. Um, somebody figured out, and there were variations of this type of an instrument found throughout the world before technology, because people found out that if you forced air through a very small opening, it could make a very loud noise. And so the great Highland pipes were not unlike this. They were very loud. And so there are many tunes that we play that tell the troops what to do during battle. So the pipe the piper would stand near to the Lord and um, take command from the Lord who would direct the piper to play, to communicate with the troops as to what they were to be doing at that moment. And so yeah. there are many tunes we still play to this day that are battle tunes and retreats. Yeah. But I may, um, um, I mean, um, uh, they're still, you know, pipe, pipes are still used in the British army and the Canadian army and the American army as well. And um, and others and and it, it fascinatingly and it, it'll 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 have to be um, gone into more detail I think when you when you cover McGillivray but um, in the First World War the local Inverness battalion um, of the Car Queensland Cameron Highlanders my own great uncle Alexander McBain um, was a captain in the in the battalion and um, Ian McGillivray commander of Clan McGillivray. Two of his great uncles were also in the battalion, and one of them was a piper. And he was killed um, while playing his pipes in a battle. And the pipes were returned with his blood still on them. And Ian plays them to this day. I know Ian very well, and I did not know that those are the pipes that he he plays. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh. that, that's... You 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 must get him to tell the story. It's really it's an incredible story. 
I, I will. I overuse that word incredible on this channel. Everybody knows there's like four words I use too much. That's one of them, but that truly is incredible. Yeah. I'm going to get him on to have him show that. And I also had him, um, he, he went out on the cloud and battlefield. I was, I was torn apart really because I'm friends um, with some of the actors from Outlander, <laughs> not to like, to, you know, not to brag or anything. Great. I was just I I became friends. We started a charity together, another charity on another. There's a little channel that has a little bit to do with that charity, and um, so Grand McTavish and I became friends a number of years ago, and um, Clan Lands at the time before it became Men in Kilts um, was uh, done by Grand McTavish and Sam Hewen, and they wanted to come back to the Inverness area and and go to the battlefield and they wanted me to come out and play pipes for um an episode and if you remember back in 2009 this was 2019 i came over but i was badly injured my kneecap was broken i had shattered my patella i still came i had a broken left hand and um, I was hobbling around on crutches and I still came over. My surgeon said, you know, you shouldn't fly over to Scotland. I said, I have to go. And I came anyway, but I could not get out on that battlefield and play pipes to save my life. And it killed me. But I called Ian McGilvery and he was able to do it. And I'm so glad oh, great. It, was, it was more appropriate that he do that. And he go out there with them and he share history with him about um the cloud and he it just worked out perfectly that it was him to do that and i i hope he shared that i never did watch that full episode of mm -hmm. him being on he was on several times i um, mean he actually went on uh, earlier last year to play for grand mctapsh's wedding um he yeah. was at the wedding so i was really glad that he was able to do that he's a wonderful wonderful human being and so we'll have him on more um when we cover clan mcgillivary but uh just a couple of little side notes there about the cloud yeah. and, and, and all of that but that's fascinating well it's been great again cindy yeah um to be with you we we, we we haven't gone back to that great but great fight between the mcbains and the and the commons down in loch Arbor, um in the early 1300s so that we'll have to come back to that another time i think Oh yes, I know you're running out of time. I I could I could do I, I don't know how our viewers feel, but I could talk to you and well listen to you. I'm just learning so much. I feel like there's nowhere we could go. There's no amount of money we could pay to learn this information. And I am so grateful. And I know our viewers are. I was getting lots of messages. You know, sometimes people are shy to post on here. Please don't be shy. Please post wonderful comments down below. Um, don't be shy at all. But people are shy to post online, I think, and they don't necessarily want everyone to see. But people are appreciating you and having you come on with your vast knowledge and 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 just the way that you speak. It's it's your your wonderful teacher. And uh, we're we're eager students to learn. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything and taking time out of your busy schedule and preparing for these. Um, greatly appreciate it. We must get, if you have the time, and again, no pressure, I, I feel very guilty <laughs> for taking so much of your time already. Um, I would like to talk about that fight. That's another fascinating uh, yeah. So many questions that I know um, I would love to hear about that. I need to get my hands on the far manuscript so I can read that and have be able to ask more questions and chime in because that's something I wasn't aware of until, you know, what, two or three weeks ago. So I need to get that book and a couple more and and, and try to play catch up. No. <laughs> And have great more questions like this i'm so excited so before we leave you um for this episode and you know i can always edit this if it's not appropriate is there any do you want to touch on your personal experience um that you kind of shared with me and, and no pressure if you don't feel comfortable but about um uh, how well what's happened uh, with you personally in relation in regards to the um, Gillies McBain having killed 
Lord Robert Kerr. Ah. <laughs> so, so, okay. Well, okay. It's a, it's a quick one. So, Lord Robert Kerr was the second son of the Marquis of Lothian. And it just so happened that many years later, I sat next to um, the person who's the, the current Marquis of Lothian, but at that time he was the Earl of Ancrum and called um, Michael Ancrum. And I sat next to him at a dinner. And when we were introducing each other and discovering who we were, I said to him, well, um, because Gillies actually was a was a relation of mine. So so I, you know, so he 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 was he was um a cousin um um through through um interestingly enough through through my through my mother actually rather than my father's McBain forebears. Um I mean a closer cousin through my mother, um it seems. Anyway, um I I was um sitting next to him and said um that uh uh one of my relations um funnily enough had um killed one of his relations at Flodden. you know um gillies mcbain who killed lord robert kerr anyway he was um um i'm not sure he was terribly pleased that i brought this subject up but <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, but yeah he did he did he acknowledged the story and acknowledged that yes, that 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 was their re recollection that it was Gillies that killed um, Lord Robert Kerr, um, which in itself is a, is an interesting thing to note. Um, but um, so we had a very interesting initial discussion um, sitting next to each other before we got down to enjoying a, a lovely dinner. Did he share anything uh, with you about that event that you want to share, or or just the no, 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 knowledge no. That, of it? That was it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just one of those chance encounters. Oh my goodness! That one has. <laughs> you know, the world is really actually very small, is it not? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But I, 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 I kind of wanted to get that on the record if you were comfortable, uh, just because you know, I, I feel like. This history, this is a living history that's gone on with our our families that we're focusing on for almost a thousand years or maybe a thousand years or more. And we people live for specific periods of time, obviously, like I'm stating the obvious, right? But for me, mm. it kind of sets up my thought in all of this. Back in the day, you know, maybe people's lifespans were 50, 60, maybe 70, if they were lucky. Now we're we're pushing 100. We can live for almost 100 years if we're lucky. But we all play a part in this. We all are playing our part and adding to it and keeping it going as it's living on. And you, my friend, are doing this in such a magnificent way. And that's part of your part. Oh. That is, this is all part of your part that you're playing in this and keeping it going. And, and this is so important and thank you. Thank you so very much. And I wanted to also let the viewers know and Clan Hatton Association members and anybody else who's interested, obviously, if you're watching, you're interested, um, that the Culloden battle, the commemorative memorial celebration is coming up. I don't know if we should call it a celebration. Let me reword that. The commemoration of the Battle of Culloden is coming up in April. So it's good that we're talking about it and had the discussion now. It will be at the Culloden Battlefield on April 13th. It's a Saturday. They always do it the Saturday closest to the actual battle, which is April 16th. And so this is put on by the Inverness Celtic Society. And I'll put some links below. I've been trying to find more information about it online. I haven't found a lot, but I'm gonna share below what you have. Donald and Denise um, will be in attendance and hopefully they'll be able to send some of the footage back so we can share it here. I won't be able to go this year for that, but um, what an important um, event. And so we'll we'll circle back in April and, and hopefully have some more information about that and footage for you. Um, yeah. They go to that that service on the battle. That would be great because there's always a Clanhattan wreath laid, as you say, by Donald and Denise, 
And um, so anyone watching that, any film footage, will see um, them carrying the banner of, um, there'll be a Clanhattan banner and there'll be the Macintosh Chiefs banner and, um, and others. It, it, it's quite an occasion. Hopefully, I, I would really love to go next year. I'm going to get it on my schedule and, and make every effort to get over there for that. And and Philip, thank you again so very much. Thanks for being on. Uh, I hope pleasure. you'll come back, not to reiterate, but please come back as often as you can, as, as time will allow. So appreciative. Thank you so very much. All right. Thanks, Cindy. Bye. All the best. Bye for now.